So one of my themes, and this is also true of Peter and Salim, has been the acceleration of progress in information technology, but also everything that we work on. So here's a chart. I actually came out with this chart 40 years ago. It shows, it shows for each year the best computer that provided the amount of computations per second. Uh, and it's pretty much a very straight line on an exponential growth. Um, and people were not even aware of this. I mean, I came out with this graph 40 years ago. It's 40 years after the progression started, and I've been updating it ever since. Now, people very often call this Moore's Law. I really believe we shouldn't do that anymore because it has nothing to do with Moore's. I mean, this started decades before Intel was even created. It's been going on for 40 years before anyone even knew it was happening. If you go to the bottom left, the first programmable computer was the ZUSA 1, 1941. It performed 0. 0.00007 calculations per second per dollar. Well, ZUSA was a German, apparently was not a fan of Hitler, but it was shown to Hitler, and, and some people were excited about getting behind this, but they, they didn't get behind it. They saw no military value to computation, a big mistake for them among a lot of other mistakes. The third computer on here is, is the Colossus, created by Alan Turing and his colleagues. Now, Winston Churchill felt that this computer would be the key to winning World War II, and that was true. They got totally behind the Colossus computer, and they use it to completely decode Nazi messages. So everything that Hitler knew, Churchill also knew. And so even though the Nazi air power was actually several times that of the British, they used the Colossus to win the Battle of Britain anyway with this computer and provide the Allies with a launching pad for its D-Day invasion. So if you go along this chart, there are many stories behind all the computers on this chart. Uh, it almost looks like someone was behind this exponential trend, like someone's following it. Okay, we're at, we're at this point now. We need to be here for the next year. But for the first 40 years, no one even knew this was happening. Uh, it just happens. That's the nature of exponential growth. And this is just one example of exponential growth. It's not that everything comes from this graph. This graph just shows you one example of how technology expands exponentially. Uh, and whether, whether we're aware of it or not. So exponential growth impacts everything around us, including everything that we create. So, and uh, and I, I projected that this would continue in the, in the same direction that I noticed 40 years ago. And as you can see, it's done that. It's gone from telephone relays to vacuum tubes to transistors to integrated circuits. As I've mentioned, people have called this Moore's Law, but as I say, that's not correct. It started decades before Intel was even formed. Of the 80 best computers in terms of computations per second per dollar, only 10 of these out of 80 have to, anything to do with Intel. Now, every five years, people were going around saying, Moore's Law is over. You might remember that uh, this, this started uh, when the COVID pandemic started, just a few years ago, people were saying, Moore's Law is over. And of course, I went around saying, okay, it should not be called Moore's Law, but regardless of that, whether Intel chips were the best value or not, this exponential progression has never stopped. Not for World War II, not for recessions, not for depressions, or for any other reason. It's gone on for 80 years from 0.00007 calculations per second per dollar to now 50 billion calculations per second per dollar. So you're getting a lot more for the same amount of money. And it's only in the last three years that large language models have been feasible. So people who believe that neural nets were effective decades ago did so really based on their inclination, not any evidence. I've been in the field of AI for... 60 years, that, that's quite amazing. Like, where does the time go? Uh, I was 14. I met Marvin Minsky, who was in his 30s. Frank Rosenblatt, who created the Perceptron, the first popular neural net. 
Uh, as far as I, I'm aware, I don't think anyone else has, has 60 years experience or more in AI uh, as I've had. But if, if, if you've been there for more than that, let me know. I have a lot of stories about that. But in the early years, it was really not clear that neural nets could do anything successful. And they're showing now that this is really the path to artificial general intelligence. We will have large language models that can understand lots of different types of written language, from formal research articles to jokes and so on. They're now mastering mathematics within the language. They can code and do so perfectly and at very high speed. Now, this obviously brings up not just that, but all the things it can do brings up concerns about its effect on human employment, which we were just talking about. But employment is really not necessarily the best way to bring resources to human. I mean, look at around the world. France is now uh, is dealing with protests because they're adding a couple of years before people can access their retirement. It tells me that people really don't like the jobs they do for employment. So that's, that's I think, a difference. We'll actually be able to do what we uh, are really cut out to do. And in my opinion, it's not just us versus AI. People say, well, how are we going to compete with AI? The intelligence that we're creating is adding AI to our own brains, just the way our phones and computers do already. This is not an alien invasion of intelligent machines coming from Mars. I mean, how many people here have come to this uh, meeting without your phone? It's already part of our intelligence. We can't leave home without it. It ultimately will be automatically added to our intelligence, and it already is.